This has been a really nostalgic week for me, I have to say, being back on this campus. It's been amazing to um, be back in this environment and just to treasure the treasure the treasure that this is and the treasure that um, my time here was those many years ago. Um, thank you, Petrock, for that lovely and kind introduction. Petrock was he said I, he was he had the privilege of reading my dissertation. He was actually my examiner. Uh, and so if you don't know what a reader is, it, he, he examined me and I, and I passed, so I guess it, I guess I was all right. but um, but anyway, um, yeah, so I'm fr I'm, uh, I'm from South Dakota, and I'm back in South Dakota now. Um, I actually grew up in the little house on the prairie, and uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch. My dad is a cowboy, and my brother is a cowboy, and my brothers-in-laws are cowboys, and, and uh, two of them were professional rodeo, actually three of them were professional rodeo cowboys at one time. So I come from a long line of rednecks. And uh, I guess you could say I have a checkered past. He kind of read some of it there. I um, spent some time in parish youth ministry. I was a high school teacher for a while. I was here for 10 years. Uh, I was a missionary in Europe. I think he said I started that radio station. I did not start that radio station. I was part of the team that started that radio station in Ireland, the first Christian radio station in Ireland and, um, and the first ecumenical one that we know of from the ground up. And then, yes, in our, uh, the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. And now I, I uh, work at the cutest little retreat center, which I asked the uh, tech people to put a picture up of, and, and uh, maybe they can do that. So I work at a place called the Sioux Spiritual Center. And uh, somebody asked me this afternoon, you know, the Sioux Spiritual Center? Uh, what does that mean? Um, and so uh, just to tell you a little bit about our place, um, in uh, the 1970s, a uh, gentleman out in Meade County donated a tract of land to the diocese, and the Jesuits had been doing missionary work all around the Indian reservations uh, of South Dakota. And at that time, by the way, are there any indigenous people here? Okay, those of you who have dioceses with indigenous people, we need to be bringing them to these catechetical congresses, okay? Um, so, in the 1970s, there was a movement called the American Indian Movement that was putting a lot of pressure on Native American Catholics to drop the white man's religion, get back to the old ways. And um, there was an identity crisis that came out of that. And so the Jesuits on this little tract of land built this house as a place that would try to communicate beautifully and clearly that it is okay to be Lakota and Catholic, just like you can be Irish and Catholic, Polish and Catholic, Italian and Catholic, you can be Lakota and Catholic. And I'd love to, I could tell you, I could stand here and tell you a whole bunch more. But anyway, that was the original inspiration uh, behind the place where I work. Um, it's a 15 bedroom retreat house in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I mean, it's way like right between middle and no and where. Um, <laughs> it's 100 miles from Walmart uh, and Starbucks. And, uh, and I have to drive 50 miles to go to church. Um, so I'm super blessed to have the Blessed Sacrament in the house with me and um, have access to our Lord 24-7. Um, but it is a bit of a journey to get anywhere out there, especially if it's raining or snowing. So, so anyway, all that to say, I've been around the block a few times. I know your world. Um, and uh, by the way, one other little side note. Um, we actually have uh, a cause for canonization happening in our diocese. I don't know if you would have heard of Servant of God Nicholas Black Elk. Um, but he is uh, in the process of canonization right now, and he is a catechist. He was a catechist. He baptized over 400 people himself in the South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana area before there was, um, well, I suppose there were states by that time. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, much to be learned there. So anyway, my hands are about 60 degrees right now, so could we just pray for a quick second? <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for bringing me back to Franciscan University of Steubenville. Thank you for each person that you've drawn into this place. And we ask you to pour forth your spirit tonight, Lord, uh, that we might uh, take the next step, whatever that is, in trust with you. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So I wanted to tell you that I am actually quite surprised to find myself on this stage. I got an email sometime last fall from someone in the conference office asking me if I would come to speak. And uh, so I said yes. I imagined I would be doing a little workshop. And, and a couple months later, I was like, they never did tell me what they want me to talk about. I probably better find out. So I, either I called them or they called me. And I said, uh, by the way, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, well, we usually let the keynotes decide what they're going to talk about. And I said, keynote? <laughs> and then I said, who else is speaking at this conference? And they said, well, we're going to find a bishop and Father Mike Schmitz. And I was like, Elizabeth. <laughs> the people that are laughing at that are a certain age. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, but I, I immediately, uh, when I understood what the situation was, um, Actually, I, I asked if there was possibly a mistake because um, I'm not a catechist, right? I'm not working like directly in the ministry of catechesis. And so whoever I was speaking with from the conference office said, maybe you better talk to Bill Keimig. So somehow Bill and I got in touch and Bill kind of walked me back from the ledge. <laughs> and um, what came to my heart immediately uh, as when I understood what, what they wanted to do with the conference, what came to my heart was to talk about the matter of uh, self-entrustment to Jesus. Um, and that I can do. So when I told Bill that, he said, ooh, the reversal of Eden. And I said, that's good. Can I steal that? <laughs> so I cannot take credit for the uh, title of this talk. I give all credit to Bill. And uh, it was really, I think, inspired. So I want to preface this talk by sharing a little term with you that I think our, um, our Dominican friends will appreciate because I believe it's an, a motto of the um, Dominican order. It's a Latin phrase, contemplata alias tradire, which translates into English as to hand down to others the fruits of your contemplation or to share the fruits of your contemplation with others. And in this talk tonight, I'm not coming to you as a theologian. I'm not coming to you to teach you how to be a better or more effective catechist. I'm coming to you as a pilgrim, as a sister in Christ, as someone who's been on the roller coaster of life on earth after the fall for a long time, uh, to share with you some of the things that the Lord has been teaching me about trust and, and about his trustworthiness. I'm going to tell you one other thing, too. Um, I had COVID in January, and about a month after I had COVID, I noticed that I was having trouble keeping track of my thoughts or holding two thoughts together at a time. I was having trouble with vocabulary. Any of you having issues, cognitive issues since COVID? Um, so that's why if you notice I'm kind of sticking close to my notes, it's because I'm scared I'm going to lose my, <laughs> lose my place. So this is really an act of self-entrustment that you're observing up here. Um, so... Um, so this, uh, what I'm sharing with you tonight are the fruits of my own contemplation, and I will tell you that they are lessons that have been hard won, um, because it brought me, and it brings us, and it will bring you face to face with the mystery of suffering, and, um, and at times bewildering suffering. So the talk of my, the title of my talk is, uh, The Reversal of Eden. Um, so let's review what happened in Eden, uh, the bishop went over that the other night a little bit, but let's do it again. God created it all, and he said it was good. And then he created man and woman, and he said it was very good. And he, he gave them dominion over everything. And just one thing, one thing in the whole garden you can't, you can't have. It's this thing, you know, this tree. And, uh, and then it says on the seventh day that he rested. And then on page two, the whole thing fell apart. An act of disobedience... Uh, was, uh, was inspired by our, the enemy of our human nature. He enters the story. He plants a seed of distrust. Did God really say that? Well, you know, he probably only said that because he's holding out on you. You know, I mean, there's more, you know. Um, and he entices them into an act of disobedience. And that, that one tree that, that the Lord had put a fence around and said, don't eat this, they ate it. And that moment is the backdrop of human history and, and of our personal history. So we live on life on earth after the fall. That's where we still are, life on earth after the fall, also known as the Valley of Tears. We were born into a wounded state of affairs. 
you only have to pick up a newspaper or check your internet feed to know that that's true, okay? Um, something has gone wrong here. It's a mess. Um, it's not safe. Things are not usually straightforward. It's messy. We are messy. Um, our relationships are messy. Our church is messy. Um, that difficult beginning, that initial act of distrust has left a mark on all of us, and it has kind of warped our vision. And even though the process of our healing has begun in our baptism, we still carry the vestiges of original sin, that, that kind of, that lean, you know, uh, towards distrust. Now, my life has been very deeply uh, shaped by the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and much of what I've learned about self-entrustment came through my experiences on retreats where I've made the spiritual exercises. One of the exercises that St. Ignatius has you do is to imagine that you are in the throne room of heaven, and there's the Trinity, and the Trinity is looking down at everything going on on the earth. And they're like, yikes, what's going on down there? They're killing each other. They're hurting each other. They're cheating on each other. They're stealing from each other. And then they're all going to hell. Like, we can't, we can't leave things like this. We cannot, you know, we can't, you know, if God thinks about ethics, I don't know. Uh, we can't ethically keep creating these cute little creatures that we love and then, then just end up in hell. We've got to do something. We don't want to stop creating because our nature is to create and to do creative things, right? Um, and so they conferred together in heaven and they, they strategized and they decided together that the second person of the Trinity was going to go down there and sort this out. But now that the second person of the Trinity has this mission, he needs to involve others in his mission. And so the first one is Gabriel. Gabriel, come here. Okay, here's the Holy Land. Here's Nazareth. Here's Mary's house. We want you to go to Mary's house and ask her if she will be part of our mission so that uh, I, the second person of the Trinity, can come into the world. And so Gabriel goes to Mary's house and he asks her if she would be part of his mission, part of God's mission. And she thinks about it for a minute. She asks a few questions, and then she says, I'm in. Awesome. And then we've got to involve other people. We've got to get Joseph in. And then they're going to need some help down in Bethlehem, so the innkeepers get involved in the mission. And then they, there are people in Egypt to meet them when they're in exile to help them there. And then eventually they come back to Nazareth, and Jesus grows up, and then he chooses his 12 disciples, and they get involved in his mission. And... Uh, and then at the, at the cross, we meet, uh, we meet Veronica, and we meet Simon of Cyrene, and we meet Mary Magdalene, and we meet the beloved disciple. We meet all these people who uh, are pulled into the Lord's mission, and on and on it goes, all down through history, until here we are tonight at the John Bosco Conference. You have been invited to be part of that mission of saving the world. What an awesome thing. What a dignity you have. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. So Jesus went on mission in this fallen world, and he has invited you as catechist to partner with him in his mission to redeem the world. We're, just, we're, we're involved in a big chain reaction, partnering with Jesus in the redemption of a fallen world. And we ourselves are fallen, uh, and we are in the process of being redeemed. And, you know, I think we hear that word, redemption, redeemed, so often that maybe we forget what it means. So it's, it's worth pausing here just to remember what it means. It means the act of gaining or regaining something in exchange for payment. So that would suggest that what is being redeemed is something of great value, something that is precious to the one who lost it. You are precious to the Lord. Every child who comes to you for catechesis is precious to the Lord, and he is in the process of redeeming each one. So God created us for relationship with himself. Some people have kind of a hard time with that idea of, uh, of our faith as a relationship with God. I, 
Um, when I was in Ireland, I, uh, I gave a talk on evangelization one night, and I had this kind of little gimmicky thing I did. You know, I'd say, I have 50 euros in my pocket, which I usually didn't. Uh, I, I have 50 euros in my pocket, which I will give to the first person who can tell me what is the first line of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I knew I was safe. <laughs> there were all kinds of guesses. Uh, nobody ever guessed it. And what it is, it's, it's uh, John 17, 3. Eternal life is this, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God wants us to know him. You know, and in this room where I was teaching, uh, these were devout, pious Catholics, practicing Catholics in Ireland, Irish Catholics. And this lady pipes up and she says, but we can't know God. God is the unknowable one. And I was, I was a little bit stunned, you know. Um, and I, and I, had to, I had to converse with her for a few minutes, but to, to, to say that uh, Scripture is uh, God's own self-revelation, right? He has revealed himself to us. He wants us to know, right? And the more we know him, the more we're going to love him. But we have an enemy. We talked about that before. He showed up in Eden. We have an enemy, and his agenda is to prevent that. So he tries to twist our image of God, uh, because if he is successful in that, he's going to win everything. Everything else is going to fall apart sooner or later. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verses 3 through 5, is kind of a battle cry for catechists. I'm just going to read it to you here. Paul writes, Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have a divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to Christ. That's the point of attack, our image of God. That's, what the, that's the, the essence of our spiritual battle. The, the enemy of our human nature attacks uh, against the true knowledge of God because the more warped our understanding is, uh, the more warped our understanding of God is or our vision of God, the more problems we have in loving him, worshiping him, and, and trusting ourselves to him with our whole hearts. And our enemy does not want that to happen. He does not want that to happen. Father Jacques Philippe, uh, one of my favorite spiritual authors, um, wrote a little book called um, uh, Searching for and Maintaining Peace of Heart. And in there, he wrote, the great victory of the father of lies, of the accuser, is succeeding in putting into the heart of a child of God distrust vis-a-vis -vis his father. It is marked with this distrust that we come into the world. This is the original sin, and all our spiritual life consists precisely in a long process of re-education with a view to regaining the lost confidence by the grace of the Holy Spirit who makes us say anew to God, Abba, Father. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is this business of the re-education and trust and my own, you know, uh, contemplation on that problem because it has been a big problem for me. I actually was born on the Feast of St. Martha, um, you know, and uh, so there's, that's highly meaningful in my life. You will understand a lot about me if you understand that I was born on the Feast of St. Martha. Um, so... This business of, of re-education and trust has been a roller coaster for me. Thank God, you know, the Lord got a hold of me when I was young. I was, um, you know, uh, I would say this. I was a cradle Catholic. My parents did everything right, or almost everything, okay? They took me to church. They had me baptized. I went to catechism classes. Um, we didn't have a Catholic school in our, in our town, and so uh, I went every week. And, um, uh, but I was not getting the lights on. Okay, we, my, when I say my parents did everything right, um, I, I mean everything, right? They, they, they were open to life, their whole married life, um, but largely out of a fear that my mother had that otherwise she would end up in hell, right? And so this, 
this image that I had of God in my mind was, was kind of warped like that. You know, I had an image of God that he was watching me carefully to catch me doing something wrong so that he could banish me, you know. And, uh, but when I was in high school, I had the for good fortune of having a best friend who, she played an absolutely critical role uh, in my discovery of God's love. She was 14, and she really was my first spiritual director. Um, under her wing, I took little baby steps towards God. I learned to read the scriptures. I learned that, that God communicates through the scriptures. And, uh, and all these little stages that Sherry Waddell talks about in her book, those were unfolding in my friendship with this, with this girl. I trusted her. I trusted her. She made me curious. You know, there's something in the tone of her voice that made me think, maybe I don't have this all right, you know. Well, anyway, one night she was excited. By the way, I should mention she was not Catholic. So one night she called. She was really excited. There had been a missionary speaking at her church, and uh, she, was, she had really gotten a lot out of his talk. And she said, I have decided to dedicate my life to Christ. Do you want to? And I said, no. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. I had no category for that. Um, and I think in many ways, uh, just the culture of our, um, of our ecclesial life, you know, the main category for uh, in dedicating your life to Christ is religious life, right? And uh, I was 14. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about being a nun, you know? And I think that is one of the, one of the big challenges uh, that we have as a church. How do, we, um, how do we make the conscious act of self-entrustment to the Lord uh, a more um, explicit part of the way that we form people? Um, this is a good time maybe to, to tell you a little story about Barbara Morgan. She was the founder of the catechetics program here. Barbara's mother uh, was a Baptist, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if my colleagues would correct me. Was she Baptist? And she got a word from the Lord at some point that God wanted her to become a Catholic. So she did. And then she had Barbara. And I presume she probably had Barbara baptized as a baby. But one day, I think Barbara said she was four years old when this happened, her mother sat down with her and invited her, or helped her, to invite Jesus into her heart. Okay? That was what formed the disposition of Barbara to respond to the grace that was already present to her in her baptism. And here we are. Look at the fruit. Boy, talk about seed that landed on a good soil. You know, what would happen if we did that more often with our little baptized kids that have all that latent grace kind of sitting in there? You know, if we were to invite them to a conscious awareness that they invite Jesus in, you know, he's standing at the door knocking. And they can say, come on in, Lord. How powerful would that be? St. John Paul II, when he uh, uh, sort of was talking about the kerygma in uh, Catechese Tridende 25, he said that the kerygma is the initial ardent proclamation by which a person is one day overwhelmed and brought to the decision to entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith. What? What? <laughs> Entrust himself to Jesus Christ by faith? Okay, you're all catechists. When was the last time that you saw somebody get overwhelmed and brought to the decision to entrust themselves to Jesus Christ by faith? Uh, another place in Catechesa Tridende, he says that the one who has entrusted himself to Jesus Christ endeavors to know better this Jesus Christ to whom he has entrusted himself. I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of time trying to catechize people who are not endeavoring to know better this Jesus to whom they have entrusted themselves, right? Um, so what if we looked at this differently? What if we looked at this process of um, coming alive in the faith uh, with the, um, the act of self-entrustment being an explicit part of it? Um, how powerful that could be. So... Um, I could tell you many stories about my ups and downs in my journey with the Lord, but I want to kind of fast forward to uh, an event that came about when I was here in Steubenville uh, in 1997. I had made the spiritual exercises uh, of St. Ignatius some years prior, uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, in a format that's called the 19th Annotation Version of the, or it's also called the Retreat in Daily Life. And uh, it was and is uh, kind of a school of prayer, uh, and a school of discernment. 
Uh, I graduated from the university in 97, but I was fortunate enough to, to land a job here. And, uh, but I had a lot of questions about the direction of my life, about my vocation. Uh, there were some big decisions on the horizon, and I was terrified. Um, I, was, I was so anxious that I actually had a prominent lump in my throat right here. Sometimes made it difficult to, to swallow. Um, I don't want to go into all the details of what the things were that I was praying about and anxious about, but um, I was sharing with my mom, my mom's a medical person, uh, that I had this kind of lump in my throat. And she said, oh yeah, that has a name. It's called Globulus Hystericus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so anyway, I had wanted to make the 30-day, that's kind of the, you know, the Cadillac version of the exercises. I had wanted to make the 30-day for some time, but I didn't make a lot of money here, and I didn't have a lot of vacation time, and um, I, I couldn't afford to go to a retreat center for 30 days. But one summer, I figured out a way to do it, the summer of 97. Um, I was able to, uh, Father John Harden had written a book called Retreat with the Lord. I found some of his conference talks. I figured out if I prayed three hours a day, I could work it in around my day job. I could keep a low profile in my social life. Um, and uh, so I made a modified version of the 30-day. And um, I still count it as one of the greatest graces of my life. Day after day, I went to prayer. And the Lord was pushing my buttons on the issue of trust constantly. Um, there is a, an exercise in the exercises called the, the Call of Christ the King. And it's, a, um, it's an invitation that you're supposed to kind of imagine your way into that the Lord uh, wants to go on mission. He wants to go actually on crusade. He wants to conquer the world, and he wants you to be part of it. And uh, so you're supposed to pray about, you know, uh, what would I say if he did that? And so you pray about that. And then, and then there's a, a prayer. Ignatius says, those who wish to distinguish themselves in, in this uh, make bigger offerings like this. And it goes into this little prayer. Eternal Lord of all things, in the presence of your blessed mother and all the heavenly court, I protest that it is my earnest desire uh, and my personal choice, provided only it is for your greater glory, to imitate you in bearing all wrongs and all abuse and all poverty, uh, both actual and spiritual, da, 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 da. I don't remember the rest of what it was. But I stopped short when I came to that prayer. I was like, hold on a second here. Uh, because I am not open to all abuse, all poverty, and all uh, wrongs. I am not open to that. And I got stuck. I couldn't move forward in the exercises because I, I didn't want to say no to Jesus about anything, but I did not want to say yes. This was the picture that sprang up in my mind, that someday if I say yes to this, if I, if I pray this prayer, I am going to end up homeless on the streets of St. Paul in the wintertime with no mittens, and a gang is going to jump me in an alley, and that's what's coming if I agree to this, and I have to say yes in fr up front. <laughs> You know, uh, not, you know, for an anxious person, somebody who's already anxious, you know, maybe. But anyway, I sat with it for two or three days, and finally I just got to the point of, okay, I'm stuck. I'm not saying no. So, okay, I'm going to take the leap. And I took the leap and I said the prayer. Uh, and uh, that was the first exercise where I knew I didn't trust the Lord very much. Um, the exercises take you into a deep meditation on the life of Jesus. And so I was meditating on the Beatitudes one day. And, uh, okay, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted. And I couldn't help but notice that a lot of these things don't sound like blessings. You know? Uh, and I was looking at a crucifix on the wall of my apartment on Oregon Avenue up there. And uh, my own future was looming before me. And I said to Jesus, I am just so afraid that I'm going to make a mistake that I'm going to regret. And Jesus, with his arms spread wide, said, was this a mistake, Carol? And my, my stomach dropped into my shoes. I had never thought about that. It sure looked like a mistake, didn't it? 33 years old, crucified, uh, accused of blasphemy of all things. Um, 
he got mixed up with the wrong people. You know, maybe this wouldn't have happened if he had done something different. You know, that was where my, I had a master's degree in theology and I'm thinking these thoughts, right? Um, so I said, well, Jesus, that's why it's hard for me to trust God because I don't want to end up where you are. So anyway, we, we, we carried on. And uh, one night, uh, I remember in particular, I was, I was praying on the scripture where the storm on the lake comes up. And I had an area rug, one of those oriental rugs on my living room floor. And so you're supposed to imagine yourself very intensely in these scenes, right? So I sat down in the middle of my rug and I imagined I was in the boat. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I was in that boat in my head. I was truing and froing. And um, anxious, I was, you know, in the back of the boat with my fingernails dug into the seat. Um, and, um, and then I heard somebody say, it's a ghost. And then I heard someone say, it's the Lord. And then I heard Peter say, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out there. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Someone's laundry blew off the line, and he is going to step out of this boat. And I start planning the funeral you know, and imagining how I'm going to tell Peter's wife, you know. Well, you know the story. Peter, he goes under, and the Lord pulls him out and puts him back in the boat. And then the Lord says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But as I meditated on it, it, it wasn't a word he spoke to Peter. It was a word he spoke to me. I'm from a little town called Faith, South Dakota. So I am she of little faith. <laughs> Yes, Lord. So I had, a, I had a little conversation. You're supposed to have a little chat with the Lord after you have the meditation. So I, was, I followed up with this conversation. Jesus and I are sitting in a boat in this meditation. We're eye to eye, knee to knee. And I said, Jesus, I wouldn't mind learning to walk on water. That's okay. I'd love to learn to walk on water. I just want to do it on a nice day close to the shore. And he said, Carol, I cannot teach you to trust me if it doesn't count. So I had to go pray about that a lot. Uh, every day it seemed like there were these moments like this where he would push the envelope some more constantly, you know, putting, putting the disciples into situations where they were in over their heads and out of their depth. Um, so fast forward, I get to the third movement of the retreat, deep meditation on the Lord's passion, and by now I was sick of the retreat. I wanted it to be over. Okay, I want this to be done. I'm tired of it. And uh, that particular day, I, was, I had one more hour of prayer, and I very seriously contemplated the possibility of just not doing it. That was the devil, I will tell you, because I got the greatest grace of my life that day. I, I opened Matthew's Gospel over in the Portiuncula, right over there. This is where this happened. It was in the Portiuncula, opened Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, and you know the scene. Jesus is on the cross. They're throwing lots for his garments. Uh, there are people walking by who are mocking and spitting at him and making fun of him. And even the guys on the other crosses are reviling him. And um, the uh, religious leaders are going by, and they're mocking him too. And they say, he trusted in God. Let God save him now if, they want, if he wants him. And I said to Jesus again, you see why I don't trust God? I don't want to be where you are. And he said, okay, we'll read on. And so I read on, and you know the story. Jesus dies. And then there's an earthquake. And then there's an eclipse of the sun. And then people's graves start coming open, and people start getting out of them. And the pagan Roman centurion who's been overseeing this whole scene suddenly has a conversion and says, this was the Son of God. And the people that had been mocking him and, and uh, making fun of him and spitting on him went home, Scripture says, beating their breasts, as in, what have we done? What was this? Yeah? I got to thinking. Three days from now, he rises from the dead, and three months from now, these people are being baptized, which means that Jesus' trust in God was vindicated and this grace came crashing down on my head that God is trustworthy. He really is trustworthy. And the lump in my throat dissolved like that. I was healed of anxiety. Not permanently, but, you know. <laughs> it was a big grace. 
And it's, it's one that I come back to a lot. You are trustworthy, Lord. Um, you know, funny little story here. Um, uh, when I was here, we were, I was part of a, a women's household called House of the Beloved. And uh, we, we, we loved our name, you know. We kind of thought of ourselves as God's special little princesses, you know. <laughs> and one day, Father Dan Petit came over to give us a day of recollection. And he said, I think I've hit on your charism. And we were all excited because we were wondering what our charism was. And he said, the beloved is the one who stands at the foot of the cross. We had never thought about that before. We were shocked. Anyway, I count that moment when it became clear to me that God is trustworthy as one of the greatest graces that I ever received in my life. Um, and not too long after that, I, I, I discovered the writings of St. John of the Cross, and, um, and that too was life-changing. I do not recommend that you read John of the Cross raw. Uh, there's a book by Ian Matthews that you should use as your guide into that. But in the process of that summer and, and the months that followed, uh, I, I realized that I needed to go and re-see my whole life, the whole past. Um, and it was like, you know, putting on a new pair of glasses, a new prescription. Um, I had to reevaluate everything in light of this discovery that God is actually trustworthy. Uh, sin had warped my vision of God. Uh, and uh, when I was looking at, at life through these lenses of the fact that God could not be trusted, uh, everything was warped, you know. And when I put on the glasses that God can be trusted, everything came into focus. And then all the possibilities of the future opened up into a horizon of hope in light of the fact that God is trustworthy. So, um, so after I looked at the past and reviewed all of those things in the light of the fact that God was trustworthy, I started looking at the future. And I made a list of some of the things that I was most afraid of. Um, some of the things were on my list were, if you call me to relig religious life, I'm going to trust you. If you call me to do a difficult marriage, I'm going to trust you. If you call me to remain single, I will trust you. If I end up paralyzed in a wheelchair, I will trust you. If my life turns out to be boring, I will trust you. If I end up homeless on the streets of St. Paul with no mittens, I will trust you. If I get arrested and put in a concentration camp, I will trust you. Sometimes when I, when I share these, this list, and especially that last one with people, they laugh at me, especially about the concentration camp, but nobody laughs anymore. Um, I think it's, you know, maybe things are getting a little, a little close for comfort. Um, but anyway, that was back in 1997, and so I had, I had basically uh, given the Lord a list of everything that I was most afraid of and, and my confidence that, that he was going to be there with me in it if, if any of those things were to happen. And I have to tell you, I mean, I cried a lot that night while I was going through this, but I slept the sweetest sleep of my life that night. Um, I rested in God maybe for the first time. Um, I found a little gem uh, in Sirach chapter 4 um, where the sacred author is speaking of wisdom. And uh, it's uh, Sirach uh, 4, 17 and 18. And uh, he's talking about this person who is going to entrust himself to wisdom. So it says, if he trusts himself to her, he will inherit her, and his descendants will remain in possession of her. This is the key part. For though she takes him at first through winding ways, bringing fear and faintness on him, trying him out with her discipline till she can trust him, and testing him with her ordeals, she then comes back to him on the straight road, makes him happy, and reveals her secrets to him. Wow. Uh, so the ordeals are part of that, right? The ordeals have a role to play in, our, um, in, our, in, our, in God's plan for our life. So the Lord is, has continually called me. He'll probably call you into situations where you're in over your head and out of your depth. Um, this whole pro radio project that I was involved in in, uh, in Europe um, the, the interesting thing about it was that the guy who wanted to start it had this vision. He wanted to get Catholics and Protestants together to proclaim the gospel together. Uh, it didn't seem like a dumb idea 
Uh, but if you were to put yourself in the Bible Belt, say, here, and say, we're going to get the Baptists and the Catholics together to proclaim the gospel together on the radio, everybody would think that that was weird, right? Well, that's what happened uh, in Ireland, you know, but because I was naive, uh, it didn't seem weird to me, and I could see this crossroads between John Paul II's new evangelization and the things that the evangelical Protestants had always said were important, and I thought, you know, we can build this, we can do this, you know, and so um, by the grace of God, we did, and there are uh, half a million people a day or so who listen to this radio station, um, but because I was naive, you know, I was in over my head. I had no idea how far in over my head I was. I mean, we, we went through lawsuits. I had sleepless nights. I had heart palpitations. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a freaking ordeal, I will tell you. It was a freaking ordeal. Um, <laughs> but you remember when the Lord led the people of Israel out of Egypt, and he had them spend 40 years in the desert. Okay, they brought a lunch along. That's all they had. Um, I don't think that was an easy season for them, but that was 40 years of purification. It was 40 years of discipline where, you know, a whole generation had to pass so that when they uh, entered the promised land, they couldn't remember the pagan worship that they had witnessed when they were in Egypt. So there was this daily exercise in trust, you know, waiting for daily bread, experiencing the bountiful quail and you know, striking the, the rock for the water and waiting for the cloud to move. Funny little random detail in that story. Their shoes didn't wear out. Can you imagine? 40 years in the desert and their shoes did not wear out. The Lord knows how to take care of the details, you know. And it's interesting the way that the Lord remembers that time as a kind of honeymoon, you know, as you... If you ever read the, the book of the prophet Isaiah, uh, Hosea, uh, he, he, he refers to, you know, I'm going to lead her into the desert, and she's going to remember, you know, uh, and she's going to fall in love with me again, and then she won't go back, running back to her lovers, you know, talking about Israel. He remembers it as a, a honeymoon. And as he leads each of us on our adventures through life, uh, life after the fall on planet Earth, uh, in each chapter of the Valley of Tears, he is teaching us to trust him. Sirach tells us that he's going to lead us onto the straight road and make us happy and reveal his secrets to us. And so I want to tell you where he's going with this. The spiritual life has three classical stages. The first one is the purgative way. The second one is the illuminative way. And the third one is the unitive way. Uh, and please, God, if you're maturing in your faith and in your journey with him and in your trust with him, he's going to take you through those three stages. Uh, sometimes I think there are many versions of that that happen kind of over and over again, kind of kind of peeling the onion sort of thing, you know, where we get closer and closer. In the, in the purgative way, you're conquering sin, especially mortal sin. You're cultivating virtue. You're getting to know the Lord through meditation on the scriptures. Um, and there's an active phase of that where you're really, you know, you're working at it. You know, I remember uh, I, I didn't, what I didn't tell you about my own conversion, uh, you know, I told you my parents did everything right. But in spite of that, I was well on my way to becoming a felon by the time I was a teenager. And I had to overcome the habit of stealing, right? And uh, I remember one, one time I, I, I happened to walk through a bake sale and nobody was around and there was a beautiful piece of cherry pie sitting there. This was after I had learned what a mortal sin was. I think I was a junior and my, my confirmation teacher had explained what mortal sin was. By this time I loved God, uh, but I still had some bad habits to get over and this was one of them. So anyway, beautiful piece of cherry pie, grabbed it, ate it up, last piece of pie goes in and all of a sudden I was just like, did I just trade my salvation for a piece of pie? <laughs> So I tried it off to confession, confess that I stole a piece of pie. And then I was back a couple of days later with something else, you know, and, and that was how the Lord helped me to overcome that mortal sin, you know. And I didn't want to be displeasing to him anymore. I, I had come to know how good he was, right? So um, that's the active phase where you're actively working at trying to, you know, conquer things. 
And, and God gives you a lot of encouragement on the way in that. You know, he drops little sweets and little consolations along the way to help keeping you move forward. But there comes a time where we have to see what your, really, what your motivations really are, right? And so we're going to take the consolations away and see how you do. No more sweets. You might go to your prayer and it's dry. You might um, not be able to find any spiritual joy. You find you can't meditate there's this feeling you must have screwed it up somehow, right? It's called the passive night of sense. Um, and you feel like you're going backwards. But actually, if you persevere in faith, you're on the threshold of the illuminative way. So then comes this second phase, illumination. Now at this time, all the disciplines that you've been practicing in the purgative way start to bear real fruit. Uh, prayer comes a lot more easily. God's communication with you comes through more clearly. Your confidence in him grows more deep. Your intimacy with him grows uh, very deep. And um, your awareness of your need for prayer uh, makes you more protective of your prayer, right? Um, and you're probably going to spend a lot of time in the illuminative way. Uh, and you're probably going to experience, you know, a lot of ordeals. The Lord is teaching you wisdom. Um, but at some point, you will come to the next phase, the unitive way. Christopher West has a proverb where he summarizes what the theology of the body is in five words. God wants to marry you. That's the golden thread that runs all through the scriptures. He created man and woman in the beginning, marriage in his own image and likeness, bride and groom. Continually throughout the scriptures, he uses marriage as a metaphor of his relationship with Israel. Jesus refers to himself as a bridegroom, and the scripture culminates with the wedding of the lamb. God wants to marry you. Uh, the saints have given a vivid witness to this. If you read Teresa of Avila, if you know how to read between the lines of story of a soul, if you read the spiritual canticle by St. John of the Cross. Now, you're probably all sitting there saying, St. John of the Cross, I'm not anything like St. John of the Cross. You know, um, listen, um, you probably are not going to get the stigmata, okay? And you're probably not going to levitate like Don Bosco did. Um, but the Lord is calling you to union. He is calling you to union. Isaiah 62.5 says, as a young man marries a virgin, your builder will marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. Now, of course, that, that passage of that verse refers to Israel, it refers to the church, but it also refers to you, okay? And we, we, we know that people experience that marriage in a really intense way, um, and we read about it in the saints, and this is actually meant for all of us uh, in whatever way the Lord uh, wants, to, wants to unfold it. You're being invited at least into a courtship, to a deep interior life, um, and, uh, you know, maybe you're not in spiritual marriage. I know some of you some of you are. Some of you have already started to experience a taste of this union. Um, but in fact, uh, we are already, in a sense, experiencing or entering into our marriage with God in the gift of Holy Communion, right? In the gift of, of, of the Eucharist. And that's why we dress little girls up as brides, right? Um, because there is a nuptial meaning to the Eucharist. It's not just poetry. This is really his intention toward each and every one of you. And this uh, kind of growth in this, in this stabilization of your prayer life uh, is marvelously stabilizing. Uh, it's, it's captured in the, uh, the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this coming up out of the desert, leaning on her lover? Song of Songs. Quite a picture. Who is this coming up out of the desert? The wasteland, the ordeal, doing what? Leaning on her lover, leaning on the Lord. St. John of the Cross uses a similar image, a striking image in the last stanza of The Dark Night of the Soul, where he says, um, he, touched, he, he sort of paints this image of, of the, uh, the beloved resting on the chest of the, beloved, of the lover. And uh, he says, the last line is, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. 
If you've ever been in, ma in love, you know what that means, you know? Um, stuff happens. People are mean to you. People get cut off in traffic. We get bulldozed by one of the Beatitudes, you know? Poverty, mourning, injustice, persecution. But when you know how deeply you are loved, who cares? Haven't any of you ever been in love? <laughs> I, I have. And uh, I, the most, you know, sort of the, the memory that I have was, was during a season when I was going through one of these beatitude chapters of my life. And I, I met a man, fell madly in love with him, and it, it saved me. I mean, looking forward to seeing him got me through each day, right? Um, the Lord wants to be that for you. Um, perfect love casts out fear. The unitive way is also called the prayer of perfection, the way of perfection, not because you are perfect, but because the prayer is perfect and because the prayer perfects you. St. Teresa of Avila uh, said that even those who are in unitive prayer still commit many sins. Of course, she's talking about venial sins, but still, still sins. Fulton Sheen once said that when he was hearing the confession of nuns, it was like being stoned with popcorn. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's called, called the way of perfection because it perfects you. And perfect love casts out fear. And fearlessness is another word for trust. So the act of self-entrustment is the reversal of Eden. I think I'm starting to experience the stability of that act of self-entrustment in my own life. I was uh, recalling a moment some years ago. Um, it was the crisis du jour, uh, and it was a pretty serious situation. I'd say it, was, it hit the top five uh, in my life. And as was my typical reaction, I found myself in some pretty significant turmoil. Uh, but this time, something different happened. It was all stormy up here. But down here, I knew, eh, this is going to be fine. And it was. It was. Fast forward a little bit more. In 2019, uh, I made the 30-day exercises again uh, so that I could give them. And my director asked me, uh, OK, what's the grace you're seeking? What's your desire? Uh, and I said, Father, I think I may be in nirvana. I mean, I have what I want. I'm happy in my work. I'm close to my family. I, completed my educational goals, I've done my traveling, I'm out of debt, I don't have any desires. And both of us thought that was a little weird. But um, one night, uh, I, was, I was out, we, uh, I was at Broom Tree in the Diocese of Sioux Falls, and uh, they have a little gazebo prayer shelter out there, St. Anne's, and I was sitting out there in the prayer shelter, and I was praying whatever I was supposed to be praying about. And um, here comes this dragonfly. And he lands on the tip of a branch. And it's really unique looking dragonfly. You know they have these really brilliant blue tails. But this one had polka dotted wings. I had never seen polka dots on a dragonfly wings. But anyway, so I'm thinking, golly, that's a cute little dragonfly. And I'm just watching him for a little while. And uh, then this gust of wind came along. And it started moving his branch up and down. And then the gust of wind got to be more and more of a gust of wind, and it's bouncing the branch up and down like this. And the dragonfly is just, you know, stable. <laughs> and he's making these tiny little adjustments to his little tail and his little wings, and he's just completely stable, even though the wind is bouncing his branch. And that's when I knew what my desire was. Lord, I want to have a stable peace in my life. I want to have a peace in my life that is uninterrupted by circumstances. You know, I know there are going to be ordeals. This is life on earth after the fall. There are going to be ordeals. But I want the stability of your peace. So that became my quest for the retreat. And uh, as I got towards the end of the retreat, one night I had a dream. And that was a a uh, funny dream with lots of different parts. Um, one part of it, I went to, was going to a store to buy something, and it turned out the store was boarded up, and when I looked around, there were all these bad guys, and they, they were, they were going to get me, and they were trying to put their guns together. They were all clumsy. They were trying to get their guns together to get me, and I'm, there's one on this side, there's one on this side, there's one behind me, and I'm like, jeepers, what do I do? So I got out of the car, like you do, uh, <laughs> and I Walked over to a downtown area in my dream, you know, and it was kind of this um, little um, venue, 
and uh, they had a dance going on there, and they had a uh, ice cream bar, <laughs> and they had a Bible study going on in there. <laughs> and they had an academic class going on in there. So I went into the academic class and sat down, and I'm listening to the teacher teach, and uh, in comes this tame deer. And it was just this little fawn, still had its fawn spots. And somehow I knew that the deer's name was Placidus. And so <laughs> this all has a point, I I'm telling you. So, um, so I get to my spiritual direction appointment the next day, and I go through all the content of what had come up in my prayer. And I was just about to leave, and I said, oh, I forgot to tell you about my dream. I said, it's probably just a dust bunny in my head. And my spiritual director, who knew what I was praying about, uh, listens to me tell him uh, about you know, the bad guys and the dance and the ice cream and the deer named Placidus. And he said, yeah, dust bunny in your brain. Placidus means stable peace. I almost started to cry. I was like, okay, Lord, you have heard the cry of my heart, and it is your intention to give me stable peace. And what a sweet little image, right, of what stable peace is like, this little tame deer. <laughs> You know, so my encouragement to you uh, is if you haven't begun to get going on a disciplined daily prayer life, get going. Okay, carve out time. I know that many of you pray all day in the car, at your office, in the, um, you know, when you're washing dishes and doing all the things. But what I'm talking about is a carved out, consecrated time. Catechism says that we cannot pray at all times if we don't pray at specific times. In your prayer, learn to meditate on the scriptures. If you can find somebody to lead you through the spiritual exercises, do it. It's a school of prayer and a school of, um, of, of uh, discernment. Learn to consistently turn to the Lord in your prayer time with whatever's in your heart, whatever your trials, tribulations, and ordeals are. My spiritual director on that last 30 day had a little phrase um, about how to relate your ordeals to the Lord. And it was this, a little prayer. Jesus, I need you to see this. I need you to see this. I need you to look at this thing that's bugging me. And you look at it together. It may help for you at some point to start making an annual retreat. I try to do that every year. Um, very often we are trying to lead on empty. Um, so I can't recommend enough that you, um, that you take advantage of whatever opportunities are in your area. You know, even though I'm telling you all this stuff, I, I still struggle with the cross. I still don't want to be there, you know. Um, but going back every year, going back to the Lord, going deeper, um, whatever you can give the Lord, whatever time you give him, whatever format, he will make the most of it. And if you do this, he will teach you to trust him. And you will be reversing what happened in Eden and he will renew the face of the earth. It's been great to be with you. I thank you for everything you do. Let's say a glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. God bless you all.